yeah, so hi everyone. My name is Jenny and uh, yeah, thanks for joining. So again, yeah, I encourage everyone to try and follow along. Um, I've included some like a sample data locally just in the repo so that you can um, follow along even if you don't have a Google Cloud account. Although, um, you know, there's, we'll explain cloud learning options as well. So today we'll be doing a hands-on example of using Beam to facilitate deep learning from building training data sets to serving predictions. So we'll be using a small public data set that's available in BigQuery. It's the um, state liquor sales of Iowa. Uh, but obviously this approach can be used with much larger data sets, uh, which has you know, been my personal experience with using something like this. Um, and in the example today, we'll basically pretend that we are the state of Iowa and that we want to predict how many uh, bottles of each item essentially that we want to buy for any given month. So most of you probably already know, given that we're at a Beam Summit, but just as a refresher, Beam is an open source unified model for defining parallel processing data pipeline. These pipelines can be executed on any one of several supported distributed backends, such as Spark, Dataflow. Uh, today, we'll mostly be running locally again, like I said, so that those people without cloud accounts can still follow along. Um, and we'll also be working with the Python SDK, as this is also what we will be writing our deep learning application code with. The Python SDK doesn't have all the same features as the others, like Java, uh, but it's still very powerful and we can still do a lot with it. So in Beam, data is represented in what is known as a P collection, which is immutable. You can transform the data through some built-in transformations that Beam has, such as map, filter, group by key, uh, etc. And composite transformations can also be defined in a single P transform. Uh, the most general cooperation would be a pardo, which simply invokes a user-specified function, which is known as a do function on each element of the input P collection or collections. So here's a very general overview of the pipeline um, that we'll sort of build. Uh, there's sort of like, I guess, two paths here. One here will be for training. So for training, we'll use Beam to generate TF records from data in BigQuery, which we will then use to train a deep learning model. Today, we'll make an R and N. Um, and once we have a trained model saved and exported, we can use the exact same Beam pipeline to make predictions and, for example, write the results back out to BigQuery. So a really brief primer on BigQuery for those who aren't familiar. It is a column-oriented data warehouse that supports SQL queries, arrays, documents. It's highly performant and can do analyses over large amounts of data very quickly. Um, today, we'll be aggregating data within BigQuery itself rather than within Beam. Um, however, like in my experience, if the data is too large, this is most likely not feasible as like BigQuery will run out of memory. Um, in that case, you would just want to move your aggregation operation into a transform in Beam. And when running on Dataflow in the cloud, for example, there's a service called Shuffle Mode, which uh, makes this extremely fast, even for terabytes of data, in my experience. And then another brief primer of TF records for those who aren't familiar. TF records are a simple binary format for storing sequences of byte strings. It's like a very standard uh, data set format for TensorFlow. They enable efficient reading of data by graphs in TensorFlow and pretty much all forms of data from images to sequences can be stored. I haven't seen great support for sparse tensors, um, but we're not working with those today. Uh, today, we will be creating sequence records um, from our time series data. So just as like a little visual of what like this sort of first part of it will look like, um, the left is like an example of what the query result from BigQuery might be. Then we'll use our Beam pipeline, which we'll go through to essentially read this data, do processing, um, transform it into TF records, which we'll write out and then be able to use later to train our models. So obviously, um, as with any like machine learning thing, it's important to just look at your data. Oh, oops, did I stop sharing? I don't know. Okay, hopefully everyone can see the screen. Um, so yeah, we'll just like very pr briefly take a look at the data. So if you look at the, uh, there's this data set in BigQuery. Everyone has access to it. It's called a uh, BigQuery public data set. If I could ever, yeah, see BigQuery public data. Within it, there is a data set called Iowa Liquor Sales, and it has one table, which is just simply sales. So if we just you know, very quickly look at it, you can see there's information about the like time, 
of the transaction, the store number, address, location, things like that, as well as the um, vendor. And then over here is like mostly what we'll be looking at just in our simple example here. We have the uh, description of the item. So like the item number, which we'll use as an ID, some description, um, some information about the item itself, like how many bottles come in a pack, the volume per bottle, what the sort of wholesale cost was to the state, as well as what it retails for, and how much was sold. So if we look at the, this is the query that um, we'll do. And this is also a, a small sample of this result is basically what's in the repo. Um, and you can see essentially nothing fancy, really just grouping um, by day so that we sum up the values per day, of whatever was sold and then uh, grouping by month, essentially, such that we have in every row um, a record of what was sort of sold in the month. So if we just like do a really quick run of this, um, you can just have a sense of what the results look like. So you can see here, um, this is essentially one row is a record um, for a month. So we have the item, uh, some information about it, and here these are arrays of the sales essentially that we made of this um, item here. So now that we have a sense of the data, let's go over and sort of start looking at the code itself. So I'm just going to switch my screen. Oh. Right now, we only see your webcam. Uh, I yeah, don't know if you sorry, let it. me just. That's OK. Uh, OK, can everyone see my desktop? Yeah, we can see your, your ID when the code. OK, great. So um, I've tried to like sort of document what we'll go through in this readme. Um, but yeah, obviously, uh, first, you want, you want to do some kind of, you have to install the things for your local setup. Um, so, you know, you can install them as per setup.py. If you already have Beam and TensorFlow and things like that on your local machine, like you should be able to run the things that are here as they are. Uh, so we'll go over kind of the pipeline itself. Um, so the pipeline options runner is obviously uh, an important one. It determines what backend we're going to use here. There's two options here, direct runner and data flow. There's obviously other options. Um, but again, today we'll mostly just be doing the local option using direct runner. Staging and temp location, these are, uh, they can be either local or cloud directories. Like you could pass in the path for a bucket in GCS. Um, but this is just sort of where some temporary files might go if uh, it's necessary, which it is for um, our case here. Like, TensorFlow transform requires uh, temporary and as also a staging directory. And then the setup file. So if you were to run this package on the cloud, the workers would need to know what um, external dependencies you have. Like we'll be using some packages like pandas and TensorFlow, for example. Um, so you, you need to pass in this um, argument here, this uh, like an absolute path to the setup.py of your package essentially. Um, so if we look at sort of the input here, uh, again, you can see I've sort of like set it up. If we were doing locally, we will read in this JSON file, which is again, a sample of the query that would otherwise have been run if we were gonna run it in the cloud. So if you were to run it in the cloud, Beam would execute that query, export the result, and then read from that. But here we have this little um, local JSON file that we'll read from instead. So in general, I found that um, you know, debugging can be a little bit tricky with Beam. Some tips, I think it's easier to work with like a small subset of your data, like we're doing here basically. And um, also debuggers, they, it's not, you can't just really like insert a PDB at a certain point and see what you have. Jenny, so I, sorry, oh. is it possible to zoom in a bit? Because ah, yeah. yeah, the font is a bit slow for those in, in smaller screens. So yeah. Is this is this better now? Uh, can I go you, in one more? Do one, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. No worries. Sorry. Um, okay, so so yeah, we in general I found that you know 
it might be crude, but one of the best ways to really debug is to put in like a print, essentially, when you want to see what's going on. So let's suppose that I essentially want to see, like, you know, what I have at this point. So I might do something like this. And it's just easier to kind of comment out everything else. Otherwise, you'll see too much garbage in your input. So if I go, and let me just, is this, is this readable at this size? Yes. Terminal? Yes. OK. Um, so if I were to run, so you can see here, um, I just like, I sort of debugged, so to speak, at the first step of the input. So you can see the output is um, every element of the P collection output is simply a dict, which represents the row that we saw earlier from BigQuery. And when you read directly from BigQuery with Beam itself, you get the same result. You get a dict for every row. Um, so we're essentially like the interface after the step, I guess is the same. So we'll take like this uh, one of these examples, for instance, and kind of use it to like move forward with our as like a sample for debugging. So let's let's go with this one. Kind of see. Um, so now we move into the sort of some of the meteor pre-processing. Um, there's this uh, P transform I've defined here called map and filter errors, which let's take a look at that. So when you have a step that fails too many times um, in your beam pipeline, your entire pipeline is most likely going to fail as well. So that might be behavior that you want to keep, but it might not be. Um, most of the time, I think probably not. Like you may just have some bad elements that you are willing to discard, but ultimately you don't want your entire pipeline to fail. So it's important to sort of like try and give yourself a buffer against these things, especially if it's, you know, a very large data set that you are not sure what it is exactly in. Um, so this p-transform simply applies this do function um, to every element. So do function, when it's applied to an element, the process method is called. And we can see here, we just simply apply the um, function of self. If you are, are returning more than one element from this uh, do function, which is possible, like you can go here, we're just going to go one to one, but you could go one to many, for example. Um, you just want to like yield each individual result. And with, there are these metrics, uh, like a module that you can use in Beam where um, if, for example, you were to run this on Dataflow, this, these metrics, all these counters, for example, like you could count the number of elements, the number of bad elements, the reasons for each type of failure, these things, you would be able to see all of these metrics um, displayed very nicely. And so, again, this is something that really helps with uh, not only debugging, but like ultimately at the end, you kind of also want to, for example, know the size of the data set because like the number of epochs you do, for example, is going to be dependent on how many samples you have in your data set. So we uh, use this like sort of generic wrapper that gives us like a buffer against failures and um, wrap it around this main pre-processing function we want to do, which essentially takes in a raw sample and then outputs a dict, which will match our specified TF record schema. So let's take a look at this configuration here. So I've just put this here. Obviously, there's many ways you could configure this. But essentially, this is what I've defined to be sort of the um, schema for the data set of what we'll be working with. So the sequence length um, for every sample will be 31, because that's the maximum number of days you can have in a month, as far as I know. Uh, the, uh, there we have some scalar features, um, item description, the integer features like item ID, year, month. Uh, this last valid day we'll kind of come back to. Um, but essentially, it will represent the integer of the last uh, valid day that we'll see. We also have some scalar float features, like the um, attributes of the item itself, volume, pack size, the wholesale and retail costs. And now we have our sequence features. Oops, not meant to do that. So we have um, day, this valid day, which uh, again, we'll kind of use as a mask in our RNN. So like, as we saw, this is transactional data. So not every sequence is going to be full, so to speak. We'll pad it because we have to pad it to be the same sequence length, but um, we may not want to actually use those days that we've just padded. So that's what this valid days will do. 
And then we also have our one dimensional or sequence float features, uh, like the accumulated number of bottles sold, the daily bottles sold, and uh, total packs sold, which here, this is gonna be the target that we try to predict. So every day we'll try to essentially predict how many we'll sell, uh, we would have sold at the end of the month, or essentially like if we were pretending we're doing some kind of planning, that's what we would want, right? And then all of these go into something called a feature spec. So when you specify this, this is really like the schema for the TF records. So you use this thing, um, fixed length feature, which for scalar features, you don't want to put in a shape. You just leave that empty like it is. Uh, you specify the type and um, essentially the name that the tensor will be named. And this uh, metadata is something that we'll use to write the TF records, read the TF records. It's really like the unified, I guess, schema for our data set here. So if we go back to this function. Essentially, again, we started out with this raw sample, right, which was the output of our um, BigQuery result. And we want to essentially um, you know, arrive at the dict that matches the schema that we specified. So this is nothing fancy. It's just basically some very simple, you know, pandas operations and things like that. But we'll just walk through it. We um, use or collect the scalar features, the integer and string features, um, create a data frame so that we can do kind of this time padding that we want. Um, so if we examine sort of what we have up until this point, you can see we have a data frame with the series of data uh, on the days that we do have data. We can do some very simple feature engineering, like um, we'll add in these cumulative bottles sold, total bottles sold, which that's our target. Uh, we also have total packs sold. Um, and now to do the re-indexing or basically the padding, we'll essentially just set our index to the day and then uh, fill in the range um, of up to our sequence length. So if we look at it now, we now have the full shape, 31, as we expect. So we need to fill in the NANDs because like NAND values will not go into TF records appropriately. Um, so obviously we'll just fill in the NANDs as appropriate for the valid days. Like I said, one could argue that the days that we pad in between here in this very particular scenario are valid. So you could just make them all true. Um, a lot of times that's probably not something you want. So we'll fill in the NANDs here with false. Um, and then the days, obviously, we don't want to back and forward fill because they have values. So we'll just use this index. The rest we can just, you know, back, back and forward fill. So if we look at the result here. Um, you can see we have this uh, result. So day I've um, zero indexed, as well as you'll notice month, just um, for I, I know that I want to use them as categoricals later on in my modeling. Um, and in TensorFlow, like the identity buckets, they start at zero and go up to some number. If you wanted to do that, you could of course skip zero. It would just, you would just have to like keep an extra one there. Um, that was completely up to you. And now we'll just simply, you know, add all these features to our prepared sample. So now it's looking like something that we want. We have all of our scalar features. We have um, our padded arrays of our sequence features. And I think in general, it's pretty helpful to do some kind of validation on the shapes and types of your outputs, because that's most likely going to be the main error you're going to get if you're trying to write to TF records. Um, so it's important to check that the shape matches what you specified in the schema, the type matches what you specified. And again, like I said, that there are no NANDs because those um, often don't play nice. So you can see here, we're basically just going through the data feature spec that we uh, saw earlier in config um, and checking, you know, given if it's a type, uh, it should be a vector, if it is a vector with the correct shape and the correct type. Okay, this one is good. So essentially what we have at this point now is the P collection here, prepared samples, is now a P collection where every element is a dict that looks like this. Um, so the next step here will be doing, obviously, oftentimes for machine learning, especially with neural nets, 
um, doing some input scaling or standardization, normalization, whatever you want to call it is pretty important. So you, you could do this in many ways. Um, here I'll demonstrate how to use TensorFlow Transform. So TensorFlow Transform, the pre-processing function is like the most core, core concept. It describes the transformation of the data set. There are two types of functions that are used to define pre-processing functions. Um, one is to be a function that accepts and returns tensors. And another is um, an analyzer, which computes a full pass over the data set to calculate some kind of constant value, like a mean or a min or a max, for example, that we would use to center the data. So TF transform provides the canonical implementation is on Beam. There's two primary P transforms that you have. You have analyzed data set as well as transform data set. Um, and then the combined P transform, obviously, is just both of them together, analyze and transform data set, which is what we'll use here. You can see here we're using um, TensorFlow Transform, the implementation and beam of analyze and transform data set, where we will apply this pre-processing function, which if we go look at it, it's very simplistic here. Um, as described, it needs to take in tensors and output tensors. So it takes in this input dict of tensors, which is this, as we recall. And here we'll just do a very simple scaling zero to one of um, some of these input features like volume and path size, for example. So the result that we get from this is the transform data and metadata as well as the function itself. And um, the next step we'll do is obviously we need to split our data set into a training set and a validation set, which we can see is happening here. So partition is it does exactly what it says. It partitions a P collection into any number of subsequent P collections. Obviously here, we're just doing two, train and test. Um, so it takes a function, the number of partitions, you can pass in other arguments. So we have time series data here. We will split essentially on a date. Um, I'm actually not sure if the little sample data I had even has any data in 2020, but supposing that we wanted to we were doing this on the whole data set, we could, for example, reserve 2020 as our test and have all of the rest be training. Um, so if we look at this uh, function again, again, extremely simple, just a simple comparison of whether or not the date is um, beyond what we specified to be the test and train. So um, I will say just like as a note, this is very simple. One might be tempted to like do some kind of Lambda function in here. Uh, the, only thing with Lambda functions in Beam pipeline, at least, is if you are going to try and use like another argument in the Lambda function, like let's say you did something like this um, and you wanted to like here, instead of actually using this function, you defined, you know, like a Lambda, um, you know, whatever it was, the time, or date, or whatever. So this is not going to work. The Lambda functions in Beam, they, uh, they just can't access, as it were, like outside arguments. Um, so in general, I, I think it's, it's just simpler to make a function, even if it's you know, very simplistic. OK, and then finally, um, at least in this step here, we will essentially encode this to a byte string and write it out to the TF reference. So our encoder here, um, we use this um, example portal coder, which gives us this coder, and then essentially apply this to the train, the test. And here um, you can see that we specify, you can put it wherever you want. Here it's just going to end up in the same data directory that the sample is in under TF reference. Uh, using gzip compression here, again, there are, I think there's a couple other methods where you can use no compression, of course. Um, and then the number of shards is simply just the number of files that you'll end up with. Uh, so you can see we have train test. And then we also write out the transform function itself, which we can read in later using TensorFlow transform and incorporate it into our graph for when we do sorting. So if we sort of just run what we have now, Um, okay, so you can see we have output our TF records to a new spot. We can look at them. 
uh, okay, well, I think it's this one. Yep. So you can see here, um, you know, we have the four shards of the training data, test data, the transform function, and metadata. And uh, this is essentially our training pipeline, so to speak. So now we want to go into, I guess this is like slightly outside of Beam now, but essentially we will use this data set now to build a model. So here we'll build an RNN. Obviously you could you know, do whatever you wanted, uh, but it's always good to get a sense of what you actually have with the data. So we'll just um, really quickly like examine the TF records themselves. So if we look at the, again, I've included like this data came with the repo, like so you could try and follow along um, even if you didn't manage to run the training pipeline itself. So you can see uh, it's a byte string as we expected, but obviously in order to use it, we would need to parse it. So we would parse it um, using the feature spec that we talked about earlier. So remember, recall that this is the schema that we were creating our samples to fit. And now once more, we would use it to essentially decode the spike string. So if we look here, again, it is what we expect. It's a dictionary of tensors now. So we have, you know, item description, tensor, shape of the shape that we specified. This one, the sequence one, shape 31, as we expected. Um, uh, also, it's important that we obviously split the target from the features. So there's a, you know, we'll apply a very simple uh, function to the data set itself. And all of these functions, um, ultimately, they'll be what you apply to the data set to gen when you return it from the input function that the model will require. So once more, if we look at the split record, it's a tuple of dictionaries where the first element of the tuple is the features and then the second one is um, the target. And of course, we would like to batch the data set so we could take a look at sort of the dimensions we have for batching. Um, let's do a batch of 10. Obviously, you probably want to do something different. Um, and once more, you see the shape, again, batch sequence length. Um, so ultimately, these are, this is like not the ideal shape that we would probably want. Um, generally, for an RNN, we would want things to be of the shape batch time features. Right. Uh, so we will apply um, like a additional pre-processing function as part of the input function, which will be built into baked into the graph of our model um, to essentially shape these tensors into what we want for our model. So this part can be a little tricky um, because the function essentially needs to like work for batches as well as for single records, as well as for serving, which um, the batch size there you have to put it in as none, so it's a little tricky to deal with. But uh, here, I've just given an example of how we might do it for this uh, simple example where for the scalar features, at least, we want to make sure they are repeated for all the time steps because we just want to keep passing them in at every time step. Um, and then for the sequence features, we just need to like add one dimension so that this goes from batch time nothing to batch time uh, feature, right? So if we take a look at our example and like we get our pre-processing. Um, so this is basically what's happening in this pre-processing function. So we had our parsed record, which was like a, this is an example of one record, right? Um, if we look at our pre-processing function, what we get from this, uh, we see here that we have like the shape that we want. So this one total pixel, it now has 31 one, which is what we wanted. If we look at one of the scalar features, for example, uh, like item ID. This again now has the shape that we want as well. So 31 one. Um, and then we try again, again, it needs to also work of course for like a batch of input data as well. So we had this batch record from when we tried looking at the batch data set, which again, it had this extra dimension. The batch dimension is first. Um, and if we look at, again, same pre-processing function that, would it, that will be incorporated as part of the input in our graph. Um, we look at now the output features here. So let's, uh, so this one, again, now it's the appropriate shape, batch, sequence, um, features. Let's look at one of what was originally a scalar feature. 
again, batch sequence shape. Um, okay, so now that we have kind of all of our inputs, uh, it's handy to like keep some samples of these things around, I think, for debugging um, the model. And as of like TensorFlow 2, eager execution is the default. So debugging has also become a lot easier. Um, and generally speaking, like when you get an error, it's probably going to be because you have some tensor shapes that are mismatched. So uh, if we look at the actual model itself, um, this is like a pretty simple model. No, no claims that this is a good model or anything, simply just a demonstration of what could be done. Um, but for example, we, I'll use two embeddings here for uh, the two categorical variables that I want to use in this example. So one of the categorical variables would be an item. So I can define an embedding uh, for this item. Um, so the like max item ID is somewhere around this, but you would obviously just, you can make this whatever you wanted, as long as you had enough buckets for all of the values. And then of course the month lookup, there's just 12 values for that. Um, and then the, we'll essentially take the item ID and the month and they will be indices into the embeddings. Um, those people who have experience with NLP or things like that, this should be very familiar. Um, and that essentially will get us a dense vector that the, uh, are themselves parameters that the model can try to, to tune and learn. Um, so we just look at an example of like how the embeddings might work, for example. Let's take a look at month. So month, as we saw, it should, we expect it to have the shape um, sequence length um, one. The embedding, again, 12, because that's how many months there are. I just chose two randomly for the actual embedding dimension. Um, and you can see here, if we just were to get the lookup from the embedding, there's actually going to be like an extra dimension. So you can see here, the shape has now become 31, 1, 2. So we can't have this extra one, which is why it's uh, important to do the reshape. And again, why it's important to make sure that you're always keeping track of your shapes. And then if we were to sort of add in one of our sequence features, so like we just have a very simple sequence numerical feature, which um, again, like we saw, should be sequence length one. Um, we can concatenate all these inputs together. And the shape is as we expect. It's 31 uh, or batch time and then features because we have two from the embedding and then one from this numerical feature. And we create a very simple RNN, just one LSTM um, and then a dense layer for the output, which again, obviously is just like a single unit for the output. You just have one value per unit of time um, and look again at sort of the outputs that we would get. And once again, this is good. So shapes, all good. Um, essentially, now, I guess the, again, the only tricky piece is really just this exporting piece. So when it comes to exporting the model, you have to make something called a serving input function, which essentially is defines the API of the model. Um, and the serving input function will use feature placeholders which should match the feature spec we use in our beam pipeline. So you can see here, we have feature placeholders. We are going through the feature spec and for everyone putting in a placeholder for that feature, which has the shape none. And again, this none is to account for like a variable batch size and the shape of the feature itself. And so, like I said, the this shaping thing can make the, um, Pre-processing is slightly tricky because you have to maintain this none feature here, but um, this example is shown above. We've managed to do that. And so if we run this model, uh, let's pass in, oh wait, I think I, okay, so this is, um, yeah, the set of TF records that came with the repo. So we'll just read from that. Again, it's very small, so nothing too exciting will happen at this stage, but hopefully we'll just get a sense of seeing it work. Um, so yeah, the loaded the data from the TF record data set, initializing the graph, it's saving some checkpoints, did some evaluation, um, exported the model. So if we look now at this location, 
we should hopefully see a saved model. Uh, I think it's here. So yeah, we see um, this saved model.pd. So this is the standard format for um, essentially like a model binary in TensorFlow. Okay, now for sort of the last, I guess, full end-to-end -end piece, I guess, we have this trained model that's been saved and exported. We use it now to serve predictions using the same beam pipeline that we actually use to generate the TF reference. So having a unified training and prediction pipeline is obviously very crucial. Uh, if any feature is being processed differently between training and prediction, your results are most likely, most likely not going to be valid. Um, and using Beam, we can very easily really unify these two things um, and essentially add prediction abilities to the same pipeline as we use to generate the training data set. So here in our scenario, it's uh, I'm like sort of demonstrating a batch prediction paradigm. Uh, there's certainly support to do streaming and Beam as well. Um, but here we'll just sort of do like a batch setup. So for the input, again, very similar. Uh, if we were to run on the cloud, we would do some kind of query and that the result of that would be exported by Beam and read. Here I've again included a little sample JSON of, um, so this is the same as the output. It's just that uh, for the sake of pretending that we are running, I guess, a pipeline, we are pretending, so to speak, to be at a certain point of time. So you can see here in the prediction query, the only difference is that I'm basically pretending that right now is uh, July 16th, for example. And so we're at July's, or, yeah, July 16th, and today we want to make an example for, or prediction for what the total amount of sales would be for the end of July. Um, in reality, like this, I guess, backdating probably would just happen naturally. You would only have the data you have up until today. But um, again, we can sort of examine what we have at each input. So, you know, if we were to try to debug this, what does this look like? Let's do the same thing. So here we would hopefully expect to essentially see the uh, same kind of output as or input as we did with the training, right? Obviously the, the main difference is just like here we're pretending that we only have data for this month because this month's sequences are the only months we're interested in making a prediction for. So if I was to again take one of these as sort of like my raw sample uh, to work with. So let's just use this one. Um, we can sort of work on debugging or stepping through the uh, model predictions. So for the model predictions themselves, we, again, all the steps here are the same. The input is the same. It goes through the exact same um, pre-processing function as we did for the training. The TensorFlow transform function, recall that that was itself baked into the graph of the model. So it's not in the pipeline of the prediction, but when we pass the data to the model, if we go back to look at the model, you can see here, this, the transform there is on the model side, I guess. Um, so again, we're, we are sure that we're sort of doing the same things here. Um, and we apply simply a, a far do of this predict um, do function that I've written, uh, which simply takes in the model directory, which is just the path of where that saved model PD could be found. Um, so if we just take a look at this uh, predict function. Uh, we take in the through this. So we'll take in the model directory, basically recreate the graph, load it again from this um, saved model. Um, so let's run through this. So we can see here, if you look at signature def, this should essentially be what I described as like the API of the model. So if we look at this, you can see that it has the inputs which match um, the feature spec that we described earlier. 
all of the same features, the same shape, the same types, which is good because that is the output of the prepared sample P collection, which will then be fed as the input to this one. Um, we can look at this P tensors object, which these are, again, the tensors that we would expect to basically pass into the model. And this is the output that we would get out from the model. So it's not named here, but obviously you can name it. I just, that's the default name. Um, and then the, so the feed dict is essentially what we will pass to the model. Like this is the payload. If you were to think of the model as some kind of service, the signature definition as an API, this is the payload. So here we have um, the tensor that it should be, as well as the value that will be passed in as the tensor essentially. And so this is what I meant by earlier saying that the serving, it really, it needs to work for like a single example because here, this single example will get passed through, right? Although we had batch size none, like none could be zero. Um, and it also needs to work for batches as well. And finally, if we look at the results themselves, so we get, as we expect, um, a output of, oops, I think it's, I also have to get the uh, as we expect just the one because when we have the one record in the batch, uh, the sequence length, and then the feature itself. So going back to the um, much earlier mentioned this last valid day, uh, because we have a sequence model here that's returning a prediction for every day. In reality, if we wanted to use this, we would sort of need to choose the correct index, as it were. Um, that's what we would essentially use last valid day for. So the last valid day, if you recall, it was essentially a marker of like where we were uh, at that point in time. Um, I don't, it's not as important to do in this example here because we're predicting the end value at every step in time. But if you were supposedly uh, predicting, you know, T plus one at every T, then obviously the index of like the correct T is obviously important, right? Because if we are in the middle of the month right now, only this data was real. All of this data was just padded and filled. And so you want to just take the prediction that was um, off of today, so to speak, and not the predictions that were made feeding in data that we essentially made up. So um, if you see here, we can essentially return this dict of outputs, which in the case of if we wanted to, for example, write out to BigQuery again, supposing we were running this in like a batch every day, and we were going to output the predictions every day to BigQuery again, uh, they would just need to match the schema that you specify for the table. So here, again, for those who don't have like cloud, I have this commented out, but uh, very simply, the schema is just, there's an item number, uh, prediction date, which again, I've just written this in as a pretend, this was like today, so to speak. Um, and then the actual result of the prediction, the float of how many total paths that we think will sell by the end of the month. So um, we can also run now, we can try this prediction. And you can see here, uh, I just, you know, instead of actually writing the prediction somewhere, I'm just printing them. Um, so here are all the results from the prediction. There will be a lot of them because there's, well, almost a million different items, I guess, which we will try to predict every day. Uh, but I mean, it's not slow here by, by any means, but obviously if you, you know, were to run this on the cloud, it would obviously be a lot faster as well. Um, okay, that was most of the walk through, I suppose. I made it in time. Whoa, that was pretty fast. <laughs> still trying to, I have to go over that like 10 times slower. On my own. <laughs> but um, we have some questions. Okay. Um, the first one is um, from Nate Sang. When would you use yep. Beam over something like Pandas? It seems like using Beam is more complicated. Yeah, so I wouldn't say that the two are interchangeable. Like Beam is, um, it's like we described in the beginning, a unified uh, model for being able to 
specify uh, like parallel processing data pipeline. So like you've seen, we've utilized pandas within Beam, but if you were working with data on the scale of terabytes or petabytes, um, I don't know that you could like somehow use just pandas to try and like process that data set. Um, so really like there's no reason you can't use pandas on like a single sample, for example, like what we've done here, but to really orchestrate like a big data pipeline, um, I simply just using pandas probably wouldn't cut it. Uh, okay, would you advise, oh, sorry, did that answer the question? Yes, yes, I'm just gonna okay. mask it, uh, uh, mark it as answered. Okay, uh, yeah, so would you advise using TF records even if TensorFlow is not being used? How does it compare to alternatives? Yeah, so TF records, it definitely it's like sort of for TensorFlow. Um, so if you're not, I guess, using TensorFlow, and by TensorFlow, I mean like Keras and all of that. Um, if you're not using that at all, I guess I wouldn't recommend using TF records. I'm not actually even sure how that might integrate. Um, it's possible, I guess, but like you saw, you, you have to use TensorFlow to parse the data because that byte string, it is like, has no meaning. Uh, really without uh, the schema. So yeah, if you don't want to use TensorFlow, certainly I guess there's no reason to use TF records. You could use something else. Um, how does it compare to the alternatives in terms of, so in terms of options within TensorFlow, um, I think TF records are really the standard. Like you can have very large data sets as here, we have a very small example, but you could see with the sharding, you could have thousands of files sharded and all of that would be read um, easily with like at my current place, we are, we have trained models on terabytes of data using TF records. Um, so I think in terms of speed and also uh, like parallelization for training as well as for the data processing part of it itself, TF records are definitely good to use, but yeah, if you are using TensorFlow. Um, okay, hopefully that answers that question. Yes. Would there, would there be any benefits of defining um, the session from within the setup method? Uh, so you don't want to do that. It probably won't work just because uh, it, the, that setup method, I guess, isn't what's called by the worker when it comes time to do the like actual run the function. So um, yeah, like we want it to, we specifically want it to be where it is because uh, like that's what will enable each worker to like essentially have a um, instance of the model, so to speak, like look it up. Yeah, so like this setup here is, uh, it's done on purpose. That um, here is essentially, have, placing it here is, oh, I made a little comment. You create the session for yeah, each worker. Um, so that's why that's there. Okay, there was a lot of code here. Is there a high level API abstraction for Beam? Um, you know, I, I would say like Beam itself is, I guess, already some kind of higher level API abstraction. Uh, like, you know, writing something like this uh, on the back end when you run it on the runner, it's certainly doing something. Um, you can certainly, like I said, there are already a lot of built in transforms with Beam. Uh, so, like, if we were to look at some examples, um, there's a lot of, uh, let's put this. If we looked at some of the built-in transforms, you know, there are quite a few of them. So you certainly don't have to write your own, um, like a lot of these functions that I demonstrated, for example, they were, we defined a lot of custom do functions, um, which you may not want to do. I think at some point you will have to probably define your own custom function to deal with the specific data that you have. Um, but there is a lot of, are all, a lot of built-in functions already, uh, like I said. Like you don't need to somehow figure out how to write your own group by, for example, like there's a group by here. Um, but yes, I acknowledge there was certainly a lot of code. Um, there is one more question in the chat uh, by Charles Pereira. He asks, do you always get sharded end output files? Is there a way to combine all the sharded collections into one? Uh, okay, um, so the sharded files, that 
are you talking about the output files here? Like the fact that we have, so the fact that we have sharded outputs here, that's because we specified it here, where we said num shards. So when it came time to actually output the TF records, we specified the number of shards. So here you can see I said four shards for the training records, and we can see one, two, three, four. And then the test record, I said only one shard. So essentially I got one file. Um, but if the question is about how you could combine multiple P collections, uh, yeah, there's like all these aggregation functions, right? So depending on how you want to combine them, um, there's different uh, aggregation P, uh, transforms to turn multiple P collections into one, which, yeah, like we haven't done that in this example, but if, for example, we were to do the group by, not in BigQuery, but in Beam, then we would, I guess in that case, we wouldn't be transforming multiple P collections to one, but we would be taking one P collection and reducing multiple elements into one element. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, there's a couple of more questions now. I don't one by Tatiana, one by Nate. Okay, uh, so considering we are using the same pipeline for training and prediction, but part of the data used for training was loaded in memory, no longer necessary, is there a way of telling Beam to delete that data from memory? Um, yeah, I, to be honest, I haven't thought about like the details of garbage collection. I don't know that it's such a big issue. Um, I've never run into it. I, like once the pipeline is done, the workers are torn down, for example. Here we've been running it locally, so you know there was some idea of a worker on my machine doing it. Um, but once the pipeline is over, like that worker disappears. And, and those kind of technical questions that deal more with how uh, Beam is built and, and performs, the best place to make those will be in the office hours that we will have on Wednesday and Thursday with the Beam developers. So like all those uh, like deep technical questions and implementation and, and, and like in this case, garbage collection and releasing memory, I recommend you to join the office hours. If you have a question of how to join those, please uh, let me know, uh, I'll answer in the chat. But yeah, we will have that Wednesday and Thursday uh, in the, um, we will have a virtual platform where you will be able to chat with the uh, lead developers of Beam. Yep. Yeah, and to be clear, I guess, um, just another note on that pipeline, like we use the same pipeline for training and prediction, but when I ran the prediction pipeline, it, it wasn't like whatever happened with the training pipeline wasn't still there, if that makes sense. Like we, get, I, what I'm trying to say when I say we use the same pipeline is that it's really a benefit that we can use the same code, um, but the pipeline itself is not, it doesn't linger, I suppose. Um, okay, is there an existing do function for one hot encoding or would you have to write your own? Um, yeah, I don't, there's not like a do function for something that specific to my knowledge, uh, but you could very simply, like if all you wanted to do in your feature engineering was do a one hot encoding, um, like, you could, you could do it in multiple places, right? We could do it here where we've um, prepared the sample. So if you basically wanted to add, um, you know, I think it's dummies or something, I forget exactly what it is. But if you wanted to do uh, like one hot encoding on one of the features, for example, uh, you could simply add it here and then it would be, uh, you could add it as a, configuration, I guess. You could either have it be a two-dimensional feature if you wanted, like maybe you could have it be a tensor of shape, sequence, and number of encodings, or you could have it be n one-dimensional features, depending on how you wanted to save it. Uh, but there isn't like a built-in hot, one hot for do functions, as far as I know. Thank you, and thanks everyone for coming to the workshop. And um, yeah, my email is on my GitHub. You can feel free to contact me if you have any more questions.